Thank you, Meng. I, I really appreciate the uh, introduction and being invited to come speak with you today about what the mind is and how we can create a healthy mind. Uh, it's really a fascinating idea to think about what we know just intuitively, but yet we may not be able to define so easily what is our human mind. So you may be surprised to find, in fact, that fields that study the mind, like let's say the field of mental health, um, or even a field like education where you help people develop the mind, um, the individuals in those fields, the educators in those fields, actually often don't have a definition of the mind. And as a psychiatrist and trained as a researcher in developmental psychology and working in the field of attachment, looking at how kids' minds develop, what really struck me as um, amazing in my own field, psychiatry, was that I was never given even one lecture that defined what the mind is. Also, in the field of mental health, we had an orientation that lasted a long, long time, which was that health is the absence of symptoms. And so you didn't really have a working definition of the mind, and you didn't have a definition of what a healthy mind would be. It just meant you didn't meet criteria for a disorder, so you must be healthy. Now, this is kind of strange. So when I started lecturing after the first book I wrote called The Developing Mind came out, which tried to make a definition of the mind that I'll share with you in a moment, what really struck me as amazing, and actually now I've had the opportunity to ask in person over 80,000 mental health practitioners all around the, the planet from every discipline of mental health you can imagine, psychiatry, psychology, social work, occupational therapy, psychiatric nursing, every field, the numbers are about the same. And how many people in the field of mental health do you think had even one lecture defining what the mind is? It turns out to be about 2 to 5%. So 95% of individuals in the field of mental health have never been given a definition of the mind. Now, when I started working in the uh, interdisciplinary world of bringing different sciences together years ago, the beginning of the decade of the brain, the beginning of the 1990s, I brought about 40 scientists together. And they also didn't have a working definition of the mind. And yet our task was to say, what's the connection between the mind and the brain, which is what we're going to talk about today. And so I offered them this definition, and all of them agreed on this definition, which is an amazing thing. If you know how academics works, you usually don't find convergence of an opinion. But here, people agreed with it. And here's what the definition I offered them was, and I'll give you an expanded one in just a moment. The simplest definition of the mind that these scientists agreed upon goes like this. That the mind is a process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Now, the human mind happens in a couple of ways. It happens in a body, of course. It happens, so it's embodied. It happens through our extended nervous system that's distributed throughout the whole body. And I'm going to use the word brain just to refer to that, because extended nervous system distributed throughout the whole body is hard to keep on repeating. But when I say the word brain, that's what I mean. But what's happening now between me and you? What what's goes on right now? Or let's say in Google, when you allow people to have a transfer of energy and information among them, among each other. That's what you can call sharing energy and information. So in many ways, the mind is not just embodied, it's also relational. Okay, so we can say then the mind can be defined, it's a working definition, as an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy information. Now, you may say, well, that sounds really natural. You may not agree, you may agree, but it's actually a working definition. And what's really striking is when you sit down with scientists who study the mind, let's say like psychologists or brain scientists are interested in the mind, even philosophers who study the mind, which is what I've had the opportunity to do, here's the striking thing. Almost none of them will define the mind. And they'll say things like, the mind is undefinable, or the human mind shouldn't be defined, or we'll be limited if we define it because we don't know everything about it. 
So what I say in response to that is I totally get those concerns, but if we don't define a word, how can we actually use the word with each other? Why would we have a word? And some people say, well, it's just a placeholder for something we really don't understand. And that's okay, and then you're still in the dark. You're still doing what we've done in mental health for all these years. When you define the mind as a process that regulates the flow of energy and information, it changes what you can do for defining a healthy mind. It also changes, in a very practical way, the approach you can take to strengthen the mind. Let me give you an example. If you buy into it, just for now, the notion that the mind is a regulatory process, what does it take to regulate? If you say, just on the simplest level, I want to take a person coming to me as a friend or coming to me professionally if you're a therapist, and I want to strengthen their mind. At a minimum, what do you need to do? What does it take to regulate something? Anyone here in engineering? Okay, you need to measure it. You need to have some way to measure or monitor the thing that you're regulating. And we're saying the thing is energy and information flow. So at a very minimum, you need to have a way to monitor and measure, maybe not quantitatively, but to assess, to monitor, to observe that which you're going to influence, which is the second thing in regulation. If you're driving a car and you're watching, if someone has tied your hands behind your back and tied your feet together, you can't influence the thing that you're trying to regulate. So monitoring and modifying are the two essential components of regulation. So once we define the mind, especially in this way, you get a new insight into how to actually create a stronger mind. You'd be amazed, but a lot of people live their lives just having thoughts and feelings, beliefs and attitudes, having hopes and dreams and memories and perceptions, all the stuff that we can use to describe the mind. Those aren't definitions, they're descriptions of mental activity. But they haven't developed the capacity to actually observe those mental activities as the flow of energy and information, as the mind itself. So that process of being able to see mental activity with more clarity and then modify it with more efficacy is something that you can name with the word mind sight. This ability to actually see your mind, not just have one. Now, it may sound kind of almost simplistic, but when you look at different areas of research, what you find is that when mind sight is present, various ways of understanding mental health are also present. There's something about being able to see and influence your internal world that creates more health. I'll give you an example. Let's say someone had a huge feeling of anger going on inside of them, and they had no way of monitoring that. Would the anger go away? No, they'd still have anger, right? The anger would still be changing their physiology, but they wouldn't have the capacity to have what's called discernment, to take a step away from mental activity and notice, I have anger. The anger would sweep them up, and if you're an eight-year-old on the playground of a school, and someone takes your ball, you may slug that kid, right? So we've done studies at UCLA using, using mindfulness techniques, one way of teaching a way to monitor and modify internal states. And even in preschool kids, using certain very basic mindfulness techniques, we've been able to show that you can decrease bullying. You can increase empathy. You can increase the capacity for kids to pause before they act. We've even done a pilot study at UCLA where if you teach mindfulness techniques, which I'll tell you about in a moment, you actually can take people with attention deficit problems where they can't regulate energy and information flow, and you can actually, as adults and older teenagers, you can change the way their executive functions of their brain function just by teaching them mental training. So what I'd like to do is dive deeply with you into this notion of once we have a de definition of the mind, can we define a healthy mind? And then look at a way of thinking about this and think, well, how does this work in our personal lives? How does this work in a life 
where you're involved in energy and information transfer around the globe? How does it work in the interface between a human being and a computer? These are all relevant areas where understanding how you see the mind and defining the mind may be of benefit. So the first thing we'll say is that in common neuroscience, there's a statement that you may have read about, which is, the mind is just the activity of the brain. How many of you have heard that? Yeah. Okay, so if you read, if you read any of the really well-regarded neuroscientist writers who either write their um, research papers or write for the general public, this is basically what's said. And I'm going to suggest to you that that view is only part of the story. That instead, uh, we can think of a triangle where there are three points on this triangle. One point is the brain, the extended nervous system distributed throughout the whole body, which can be thought of as a mechanism by which energy and information flow. Then there's the point of relationships, which is where there's a sharing of energy and information flow. And then there's the point of the mind, which is the process that regulates this flow. And these three points on the triangle have arrows going in all directions. So unlike what you might read if you read common neuroscience books, where the arrow is one direction, these arrows in all directions. And it's not even as simple as just there's the mind and the brain. You can't understand human experience, I'll have you consider, without thinking about relationships. Certainly my own background as an attachment researcher and a psychiatrist, we see this all the time, that relationships shape the firing in the brain and when neurons fire, they actually change their synaptic connections with each other. And so the way we learn, the way we grow, the way we develop is by experiences in addition to genes shaping the synaptic connections in the nervous system. We know that relationships shape those connections. So it would be way too simplistic to say, as some scientists do, uh, that genes explain all of how someone develops. I mean, I don't know why those scientists say it, because it's actually proven not to be true. Eric Kandel won a Nobel Prize in 2000, showing, in fact, that the way experience works is it changes the synaptic connections in the brain by harnessing the power of genes, for sure, but by experience directly. So what we have here, then, is the notion that these arrows are going in all directions. Now, relationships can involve all sorts of sharing of energy and information. You may have had relationships with your teachers in school, um, which just talk about ideas and concepts and facts and externally based things. <clears throat> or you may have had relationships which are more involving, which you feel really understood by your teacher. Uh, you really feel your internal world is seen by them. And those two kinds of relationships on a broad spectrum are profoundly different. And they activate different parts of the nervous system, which we're going to talk about now. So let's dive deeply into the brain, the extended nervous system, so you can get a feeling for where we're at now in terms of neuroscience informing us about the mind and what a healthy mind might be. And I'll start this by um, first giving you uh, an overview of brain anatomy. And then we're going to look at a particular clinical case uh, to understand um, how the mind is influenced by the structure of the brain. So Meng has been really nice enough to um, hand out a model of the brain that's underneath each of your seats. So if you reach down below your seat and pull your hand out, <laughs> you pull your hand out, it's attached to your wrist, that's Meng, I've arranged that too. If you take your hand out and put your finger in the middle, this is a very handy model of the brain. <clears throat> you, you don't have to ever remember to bring it to work. So if you put your thumb in the middle and then curl your fingers over the top, this individual's face would be in front of the fingernails. The metaphoric brain we have here, the top of it would be the top of the fingers. That's where the top of the skull would be. The back of your hand would be where the back of your skull is over here. So taking the brain apart piece by piece, if you raise your fingers up, lift your thumb up, let's start uh, the uh, anatomy lesson here. The spinal cord. Uh, brings in data from all over the body um, and first enters the skull part of the skull-based brain in an area called the brain stem. And this is an area that helps regulate your basic physiology, like heart rate and respiration. Uh, but it also has the nuclei, the collection of the basic 
cell of the nervous system, the neuron, um, that are responsible for the fight, flight, freeze response. Okay? And that area of the brainstem um, works closely with the next area. The, this is called the triune model or three part model. If you put your thumb over, you'd have two thumbs to be ideal, but most of us just have one. Um, this thumb represents the part that evolved when we became mammals hundreds of millions of years ago. It's called the limbic area. It's involved in five processes and it works closely with the brainstem. Those five processes include appraising the significance of events that happen. So if you're on a computer program, for example, and you feel not really compelled, you, your limbic area is probably not saying that's important, pay attention. So appraisal is number one. Number two is motivational states. It works very closely with the brainstem in motivating, motivating us to do certain things, to behave in certain ways. Okay. Number three is it distinguishes between different kinds of uh, memory systems. Uh, number four is it also works closely with the brainstem and the body to generate what are called emotions or affective states or sometimes called valenced states of mind, emotions. And the fifth thing that the limbic area does that people often don't realize, but if you raise rats or mice or if you raise amphibians and, and uh, like frogs or, or newts or you raise lizards, you know when we developed a limbic area as mammals, we also developed another really important function. And that's the function called attachment relationships. So the limbic area is important for us having relationships with other people that are, that are not only close and meaningful, but when we're in a state of distress, we go to that attachment figure to help soothe us. So here you see from 200 million years ago, we as mammals have needed each other to survive. We've needed each other to help regulate our energy and information flow. We are, as a class of animal, mammals, extremely social, okay? So that's the limbic area, the fifth function of limbic area. Now since these are all below the cortex, they're called subcortical. When we also developed our mammalian uh, ancestors long ago, developed the cortex, the neo-mammalian cortex, the newer part of the brain. It's the outer bark of the brain. It's actually really thin. It's only six layers thick. Um, and it has lots of folds, these convolutions that make it look thicker on a, uh, on a scan. Um, and it has two huge areas, easy to remember, back and front. The back has several lobes, like the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, we don't need to worry about that, but the, the back in general is for processing the external world. When you see me moving my hands around like this, right, we know it's the back of your brain that's being activated. When you hear the sound of my voice coming from outside of you, we know it's the side of your brain, the temporal area. Even when you feel with your fingers like this, you're activating still a back part of the brain because you're exploring the outer world. Okay, so that's the posterior part of the brain. Once you get from your second to last knuckles forward to the fingernails, that's the frontal area of the brain which grew when we became primates. And this area has energy and information flow in it that in the first part is about your motor action, what you're gonna do with your body in response to your experiences. And the next strip just before that is called the premotor strip. It's where you plan your actions, where you image what you're going to do. As you keep on moving forward in the brain, which is called anteriorly, as you keep on moving forward, and I don't know if there's a computer analog to this, but in the brain there, the way it works is the more forward you move, the more complex the representations. A representation is a cluster of neural net firing patterns that stand for something obviously other than the neural net firing pattern. So in the back of the brain, you might have a representation, let's say, of my hand here and moving here and moving here. So you're representing the visual image of my hand. But in the front of the brain, you can have a representation of something like freedom or justice or mental health or awakening. The back of the brain doesn't know what to do with those kinds of things. You know, they're really far from solid stuff, but the more forward you move, the more abstract the representation gets. Once you get to the prefrontal area, you are so forward and you're now becoming part of the brain that is uniquely human. 
we have a prefrontal cortex that is so big, our ape cousins probably think we are really ugly because our foreheads have pushed out because of the prefrontal region and we don't look like our ape relatives. But it's this prefrontal cortex that you could call the cortex humanitas. It is capable of doing an amazing set that is processing energy and information in a way that creates representations of information um, that as far as we can tell, most other animals can't do. For example, telling stories, um, sitting together and having a meeting like this, obviously inventing stuff where you can project things all over the planet, you know, and look at little dots flying up and see where the globe is and, you know, where Google is, you know, being used by people in different languages. I mean, you know, I, as far as we know, you know, rats don't do that and even apes don't do that. Other animals are great, but we do some pretty wild things, you know. And we believe that's because our prefrontal cortex is so distant from the physical world because it's anterior in the cortex, it can make new combinations that we call creativity that are the thrust of this capacity. But the prefrontal cortex, while it's creative in this way, it also anchors us in some very interesting ways in relationships. And let me give you an example. Um, the first thing to say is like any part of the brain, there are many parts. So here we're talking about the prefrontal area, which is your, represented from your last knuckles to your fingernails. The side part, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just the side area, is very important for when you put something in the front of your mind. So if you have a computer program, for example, and you want someone to remember something and then you change screens and they're going on to something else, you want to know how is this, what's called the chalkboard of the mind, holding on to that piece of data. And it used to be said that we can hold on to seven plus or minus two items. People actually don't believe that anymore. Not because we're changing, but because it's a reinterpretation of the research. That in, in, in daily life, it's probably more like three, two or three items. So just in terms of what you present on a screen before the screen moves, it's just something to think about. Uh, what this dorsolateral is really able to hold in the chalkboard of the mind. But for our purposes, we're going to look now at the middle prefrontal area. And for those of you who like to know names, I'll tell you what I'm including in the middle prefrontal cortex. So if you look up the research, you'll know what the anatomical names are. This includes an area called the anterior cingulate, the orbital frontal, the dorsal and medial aspects of the medial prefrontal. I'm sorry, the dorsal and the ventral aspects of the medial prefrontal and the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex which includes an area called the insula. Now, everyone's going, oh, no, too much Greek. So don't worry about all that. That's why I made up this term called middle, right? So we have the side and we have the middle, because it's very easy to remember for your dorsolateral <laughs> to remember that. So the middle prefrontal cortex is unbelievably important. And if you're thinking about mental health, as I hope you'll see in a moment, the list I'm about to give you is an unbelievable list that helps describe, not define, but I think describe what you may consider to be a mentally healthy life. So let's look at this list. And here's the clinical case I told you I would tell you about. Obviously, the details are changed to protect confidentiality, but this is the essence of the case. Um, a child stopped talking in school. I'm a child psychiatrist. So she's brought to me for treatment. She refuses to talk in school. And one day, as we're playing games and stuff in silence, she finds a video recorder, this is before DVDs existed, a video recorder, um, and she gets very excited. So she brings in a video the next session, and on the video is this beautiful depiction that her father was taking, it was her father's birthday, of her mother and herself playing together and dancing around and really hugging each other and looking each other in the eye in something that's called attuned communication, where two people, two individuals, become a we. Absolutely exquisite. But what I came to realize when she then said, that's the way my mother used to be for the first time she spoke in the office, was that something had happened to this mom. And when the mom came in, and I had heard the story, but I didn't understand the impact of it, the mom had had a car accident a year earlier and unfortunately, she was not wearing a seatbelt. 
and she, there were no airbags, it was an old car, and the steering wheel hit her in the forehead right in the area where this middle prefrontal area is. And she had severe damage, was in a coma for a while, had brain surgery, had plastic surgery, she actually looked pretty good, but she behaved totally differently than the woman in the video who was tuned, attuned, who was present, who seemed able to be flexible. Now this mom had severe problems in the way she could relate to her children. There, this girl had other siblings as well. She seemed like a different human being, the husband said. So I took the brain scans from the neurosurgeon with me under my arm and I went to the medical school library and I looked up everything I could find in the basic research on what these areas of the prefrontal cortex did. And as I was gathering all that data, I had a session with the mom and the dad alone without the kids there and I asked the mom, what was life like since the accident? And she says, matter of factly, well, I guess if I had to put a word to it, I, I guess I would say I've lost my soul. And this was exactly what the kids were having such a hard time articulating. There was something in the essence, whatever you believe about the word soul, if you just think of that, the idea of the essence of our personality, of who we are, this core place of ourselves. There was something about this essence that was gone. And yet she could walk, she could talk, she could write, she could think. So when I brought back the information from the scans, which I'm gonna to describe to you now, and explained it to the family, we could start to make sense of why things had changed so much. Here are nine functions that now we know from research are based on, that is they need a healthy middle prefrontal area to function well. And you just think about in your own life what role these nine functions play in yourself, in your relationships with others, in people you know. And here are the nine functions. The first is this area of the brain actually sits on top of the brain stem, as you can see from where it is, and it helps regulate it. So regulating the body, the heart, the lungs, is actually what this part contributes to, body regulation. Number two is, you know when you look at another person in the face and you feel like you're connected to them and you attuned to them? That attuned communication depends on this middle prefrontal area. And when it's damaged, people don't do that. And you can try it right now if you want to, look at each other and see what it's like when you just look at someone you feel connected versus when one of, the, one of you looks away. Give it a try, just see what that's like. Look at your neighbor, try looking and then just look, even, even just look away and see, see the difference in the feeling. Each of you try on the left side, do the looking away first. And then on this side, now try switching it over. How did it feel differently when someone was actually, looked like they felt like they were tuning into you versus not? Did you notice a difference? Yeah, everyone's nodding their head. There's a huge difference, and the prefrontal region can create it and knows the difference. Number three is to be able to balance your emotions, to let these internal valence states, we call emotions, rise enough so life has meaning, but not rise too much so life becomes chaotic, and not be too depleted so life becomes rigid. That optimal flow, which we'll talk about in just a moment, that optimal flow is what this area helps create. The fourth function is the capacity to extinguish fear. If you've been traumatized or it's a difficult thing or you're frightened of it, this area actually grows what are called GABA fibers. Gamma aminobutyric acid is an inhibitory peptide that helps dampen down firing. And the lower limbic area, the amygdala, is responsible for generating activations that are what help us feel fear. So this middle prefrontal area helps calm that down. That's number four. Number five is the ability to pause before you act, what I call response flexibility. To instead of just active, you know, just re 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 respond to your impulse, to pause, have a space in your mind where you consider the various options available to you. For a kid on a playground, this is absolutely all the difference between being adaptive and flexible with emotional intelligence 
and social intelligence or lacking those things. That ability to pause before you act is everything. And if you could just teach kids that, you'd be making a huge difference in public schools. That's number five. Number six is something called insight, which scientifically means something called autonoetic consciousness, which is self-knowing awareness. And in the brain, what we think that does is there are representations of the past that are connected with representations of the present and anticipated future. So you have this thing called mental time travel. The next one is the capacity for empathy. Different from attunement, empathy is the ability to tune into someone else and to create maps of them in your mind. I wonder what that person's feeling. I wonder what she was thinking. I wonder what memories might have come up that made her behave that way. That's an exam example. Those are examples of empathy. And then number eight, if you thought that those seven weren't enough, number eight is the capacity for morality, for actually thinking about the importance of compassion, of using your moral imagination to think about the larger social good and then enacting those behaviors even when you're alone. It's a way of defining morality. People with damage to this area, they don't become immoral, they become amoral. They just don't consider this larger social good. Now those first eight, for me, started echoing in my mind as an attachment researcher, independent of brain studies with what we had proven secure attachment, healthy relationships between a parent and a child produce those first eight. We'd proven that, not knowing anything about the brain. So I was going, wow, that's really amazing. The ninth one no one ever looked for, this ninth factor of the middle prefrontal area is intuition. Being in touch with the wisdom of the body, the heart and the intestines have actual neural net processes around them, which allow energy and information to flow. It's kind of like little computers in your gut and your cardiac system that then bring the data up through this area of the spinal cord called lamina one. It comes up like in any you know, mammal, it comes up to our lower areas where they regulate the heart and intestines, but then it moves up to the area called the posterior insula in primates, and then forward only in humans. And if you're thinking about the interface between computers and humans, this is a really important area to think about. It allows, when it goes from the posterior insula, taking lamina one data from the body, including the viscera, the hollow organs like the heart and lungs, it takes this data moves it from the posterior insula to the anterior insula. And what we believe happens when that occurs only in humans is you create a representation of your representation of the body. It's called a re-representation. It keeps you one step removed. It's called introception, perceiving the interior world. And that function, amazingly enough, has been directly correlated not only with anterior insula activation naturally, but with the ability to have empathy the ability to have empathy, which is at the core of emotional and social intelligence. So we've now, in these years, bless you, we've now mapped out the actual circuitry that allows you to have these nine functions. And if you look at your hand model, lift your fingers up and bring them back down. What do you notice is unique about this area of the brain? Well, it touches everything, exactly. It touches everything. This middle prefrontal area is connected to the cortex. It's deeply connected to the limbic areas. It actually receives direct input from the brainstem. It's also through lamina one, receiving direct lamina one input from the body's whole system, the muscles, the joints, the teeth. So you feel sensual touch, you feel the internal state of the body through this lamina one movement, which goes directly to the middle prefrontal areas, not the back, to the front, which is just an amazing finding. And as we've pointed out, you're getting the data from other people's nervous systems through attunement and empathy. You're actually creating maps of other people's energy and information flow in their nervous systems. So the social, the somatic, the brainstem, the limbic, the cortical are all interconnected as one. What is so striking about that phenomena is when you look deeply at the mathematics of that, what's that called, by the way, when you link differentiated parts? Integration. This is probably uh, 
there's a few regions that are massively integrated, but this is one of the top tier integrators in the brain. It's not that the cells in this middle prefrontal cortex look any differently or they're not really different in their structure. It's not like they're super special cells that have gone to special schools or something like that. It's their anatomical location that bridges with one synapse connections. Obviously the whole brain is interconnected. Yeah, that's true. But you're talking about speed of conduction with myelinated fibers that are 100 times faster than unmyelinated ones, and with one synapse shopping, you have basically connected the whole shebang together. So it's massively integrated. And from mathematics, those of you who are in mathematics, what do you know about when a system can link differentiated components, when it can become integrated? What do we know about it? This is now straight from math. Well, let's take a choir example just briefly as an example. If you take a choir of 10 singers, right, 10 singers, and you have them, we have differentiation and we have linkage. Let's do first where they're not differentiated. You block differentiation. You have them just sing one note all at once. Ah, and it goes on and on and on. Is there any, besides the overtones, but in general, there's no variation. It's not flexible. It's not adaptive. It's kind of dead and flat and rigid. That's one extreme. If we have what we can call a river of integration, one extreme is rigidity. In this case, you've blocked integration by impairing differentiation. Let's say you do the opposite. Let's say you take these 10 singers, have them close their ears, and have them belt out a song, any song they want, as loud as they can when you raise your hands. What would you hear? Cacophony. You'd hear chaos. And for those of you who are familiar with complexity theory, you know that when a system is not maximizing complexity, it goes either to rigidity on one end or to chaos on the other. What we're talking about is an interpretation of complexity theory that says, as this choir example would be, if we had the 10 singers up here and we said, sing a song, very often people will sing Amazing Grace. I can't sing, so I'm not going to do it for you. But if you had the choir, you can imagine them singing in what? How would they do it? Harmony. Harmony is a great word for integrated flow. Why? You're allowing the different singers to be differentiated in their voice and the octaves they attain, not octaves, the, um, what's it called? I'm not a singer. What's it called? Intervals. The intervals, thank you very much. They're varying their intervals, but they're linking with each other to sing Amazing Grace. So it's an example of an integrated flow, just to give you the few, we don't have singers up here, to give you the, the idea. This notion then, says, and here's the proposal about a, a um, mental health. When I started reading about complexity theory and trying to understand why the middle prefrontal cortex might be so exquisitely important in creating the well-being not just of this woman who unfortunately had been hurt in the car accident and unfortunately so severely damaged there wasn't much recovery possible, but her family was also hurt because the integration that is, the linkage and differentiation in this family was impaired. Now, luckily, they could go through the grieving process, understanding the mechanisms of the brain that wouldn't allow the mind of this mom to continue functioning as it did because the mind uses the brain to create itself. And if the pathways aren't there, the mind can't do it. So the kids had to learn how to grieve the loss of a mother who was no longer there, whose body was still present. So they actually did well, even though the mom couldn't recover much. They grew up well, they understood what was going on, they could even begin to uh, try to take care of the mom in various ways. It's a long story, but they've done well. For our purposes, understanding the power of this part of the brain, even through the pain of that family, is to look at the power of integration. So take a look at this list in your head, or if you've written it down, of nine middle prefrontal functions. And how many of you think that that list of nine has a number of components that feel to you, just in your intuition, that this is probably a reasonable description of mental well-being? Let me see. Okay. Well, if you ask mental health practitioners, they jump all over this list, and they say, my God, where'd you get this list? And I tell them, you know, from the clinical case, and they go, that's like, a magnificent description for us of describing mental health. So here is the move from a description to a definition. 
what I'm going to propose to you, and this is in all of my different writings that Meng talked about, so it's, you can see the detailed analysis and the references to the science. This is just kind of the take home message and a, 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 a kind of an overview. The proposal I'm going to make to you is that a healthy mind emerges from integrated systems. Integration very clearly defined as the linkage of differentiated parts so that when you have a nervous system that's integrated, you get these nine functions. When you see relationships in a family that are integrated, you know, where people are honored for their differences but linked, they want to, how are you doing, how are you doing, okay, you like vanilla ice cream, you like chocolate, fine, but let's go out for ice cream together. You know, that's a healthy adaptive family. You get flexibility, adaptability, even a sense of coherence. If you look at the mathematics of coherence, it's a beautiful book by Thergard called Coherence and Thought and Action, which examines the equations beneath coherence. And these integrated systems get that, where they embed the ongoing variables that they're encountering into how they define the in and out group. And the system then moves through time by changing response to what it experiences. Different from a cohesive equation, which is rigid in how it's defining things, and it just doesn't change. You're either in or you're out, odd numbers out, even numbers in. Whatever the system is, it doesn't adapt. So we're talking about relationships and a brain as systems of energy information flow that when they're integrated, they can move in this adaptive way. Now, in my own journey through all this stuff, what blew my mind was not only being trained as a clinician and finding it actually useful to name specific domains of integration, like the left hemisphere and the right, having them become differentiated and linked, like the body and the cortex, having them linked, just as two examples. There's all sorts of domains of integration that can outline a whole approach to promoting a healthy mind. But one very direct approach, which has been around for, it turns out, thousands of years, was taught to me only very recently because I, by accident, used the word mindfulness in a book on parenting. And I said, with my co-author Mary Hartzell, that one of the most important things we can do is be intentional and awake in our parenting. We use the word, English word mindfulness. It turned out, as you may know, that there's 2,500 years of specific mental training to develop mindfulness traits, which I wasn't aware of. Um, but since that time, I was fortunate enough to meet people who've been spending their life in modern times studying scientifically the power of mental training to promote, it turns out, and this, this totally blew my mind, it turned out to promote all nine of the middle prefrontal functions. And when I presented this to one of our nation's leaders, John Kabat-Zinn, on this, he was beautifully able to say that it wasn't just that this was the outcome of mindfulness training to get these nine functions. It turned out it was the way of being mindful to regulate your body, to balance your emotions, to be tuned into other people, to be flexible in your responses. All these things to have insight, empathy, moral living, even intuition, 100% of them. So in a book called The Mindful Brain, what I wrote about was integrative processes that link differentiated components, those are integrative, like a parent's tuning into a, a child, promote the activation of these integrative fibers in the brain and promote their growth. It turned out that there are studies to suggest, in fact, that when you do this thing called mindfulness training, there's the kind that's been studied in depth is mindfulness meditation, but there are also other trainings that we think will do the same thing. We don't know, like yoga and tai chi and qigong and centering prayer. Those are all mindfulness practices. But for now, the main, the bulk of research, scientific research, has been done on mindfulness meditation. But there's lots of ways of practicing mindfulness. For that research, these are the areas that get activated. And the neuroscience lesson is that neurons which fire together, wire together. So if you have a practice, let's say 10 minutes a day even, where you are taking time to focus, let's say, on the breath, and when your mind wanders, return your attention to the breath in a loving and kind way, and then your mind gets distracted, return your attention, to have this practice where you're aware of your awareness, 
and you're paying attention to your intention, we believe that those are the two fundamental things in every mindfulness practice. When you do that over and over again, in that 10 minute period, you're creating what's called a mindfully aware state, a, mi a state of mindful awareness. Now you may say, well, is that just the same as relaxation? Well, the answer is no. It turns out studies have been done and show that mindfulness training is not the same as relaxation training. You may feel calm or you may not feel calm, but it's a form of mindful awareness which is very different from just relaxing. That's number one. You say, well, okay, I'm doing it 10 minutes a day. Well, how is that going to help me? Good 10 minutes. What about the rest of my day? Here's the secret. When you intentionally practice firing off neurons, you stimulate neuronal activation and growth. You snag the brain, stimulate neuronal activation and growth. When you create those states, they will change the structure of the brain, and subsequent studies have actually shown that that's true to make a mindfulness trait. States become traits with practice. That's the whole idea. So what I'm suggesting to you is that here's, we've defined a healthy mind coming from integrated relationships and an integrated nervous system. We've de described its features. And now, here's the last few minutes before we stop for questions, is how do you actually do this? Well, one thing is you try to promote healthy relationships with other people. You tune into not just their thoughts, but their internal world, their nonverbal signals. You combine in every way you can a way of attuning to people's internal worlds and respecting their ability to be distinct from you. That's a relational one. In the brain, you can actually, on your own, develop, and you can call it an integrative practice if you don't like the word mindfulness, but it's basically a way of focusing energy and information flow in a way that has you be aware of your awareness, pay attention to your intention, and basically build the muscle of the mind. We have every reason to believe what you're doing in doing that is strengthening the integrative fibers of your brain, in particular, these middle prefrontal areas that I outlined for you. Now, when you do that, we know from research a couple of amazing things happen. People will shift the baseline activity of their brain to what's called an approach state. So when you do happen in life to confront things that's difficult, instead of withdrawing from it, you actually approach it. Even just after an eight-week training when people practice every day, their brain changes. Your immune system function improves. People's approach state shift, which is called a left shift, it improves in proportion to the amount of increased immune cells that are going to fight off disease. Blood pressure is improved. All sorts of physiological improvements happen. There have been studies that show empathy increases. I once did a 40-day, uh, a, a, a week-long retreat with 40 brain scientists. We weren't even focusing on empathy or compassion or anything like that. We were just focusing on developing this capacity to be aware of awareness for a week. And when we had our discussion group, two of them, one was married, the other one was engaged, said, my partner tells me, what happened to you? You sound so connected to me and you sound so empathic. What are you doing there? And what was amazing about it was we weren't practicing any empathy practices which exist. You know, we were not trying to generate compassion. We were just focusing the mind. Why would that be? Well, if you just think about what I said about the anterior cingulate and the anterior insula. We didn't talk about the anterior cingulate, but it's part of the middle prefrontal layer. When these two go together, the anterior insula's activation, which is what you practice when you're aware of your breath, hour after hour, day after day, you're going to strengthen what your anterior insula is doing. And all the studies that have been done, a lot of them at UCLA with people that I work with, have shown the higher degree of empathy, the higher degree of anterior insula activation. You see someone without much anterior insula activation, they're not in touch with their bodies, very low empathy. That's just what the research shows. Why would be that the, that the case? We're not talking about mirror neurons, but there's a whole set of neurons that suggest that we soak in what we see in other people to shape our own body's response. And then the way we perceive that body's response allows us to know not only how we feel, but how they feel. So in all these ways, having an internal education where you're getting this self-connection directly helps your connections with others. And this is where we have the opportunity as individuals to make the world a more compassionate place. But in a setting where you're actually affecting energy and information flow across 
the planet, for our entire species, you guys are in an unbelievable position to try to create a more compassionate world for all of us. So thank you very much for your kind attention, and we have time for questions. Thank you.